Good morning and welcome to All Souls. And this week we marvel at the great truth that God is transforming us into the likeness of his son. So here's a theme verse for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. It is an extraordinary thing that God sends his spirit to make us more like Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for the letter to the Ephesians. Thank you for the remarkable truths it speaks of. And we pray today that we would all come away staggered at what you're doing in us by your spirit through your word. Amen. We're now going to sing a song that praises God for the fact that he is at work transforming us. Lord, be my vision, supreme in our heart. Let's think primarily in life of what he's doing to change us into the likeness of Christ. Let's sing together now. now, because the Lord Jesus has died on the cross for us, he's made us part of his family. And so we can call God our Father. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we head into our kids' song, the Act Song. Yeah. 
Well, we transition out of the family prayer and the kids song to the family news. And first of all, thank you to all of you who have given so generously. We don't take your giving for granted. We're so grateful for it. And so we say together, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. If you'd like to give, then again, can you see that there's a way that you can do that coming up under the screen? As you can see, there it is, allsouls.org forward slash give. Uh, this Monday evening, we're beginning a new course of Christianity Explored. It's a chance for you to come and look at the Lord Jesus and ask any question you like. And it's particularly, of course, for those who are investigating Christian faith. You can uh, come online and join us online. We'd love you to do that allsouls.org forward slash explore, or in person, come in person, seven o'clock at All Souls. But do look that up, allsouls.org forward slash explore, if you've got questions or you've got a friend who's got questions and you want to bring them on Monday. On Thursday evening, that's the 10th, we have our Love, Live, Tell evening, which is what Christianity Explored is doing around the world. And again, if you'd like to come and hear more of what we're doing as we seek to serve the gospel in 130 countries, then please do uh, join us for that evening online or in person. And again, if you want to sign up, can you see it's coming up now, the tagline. And now we continue with our service as we pray together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for your protection as the pandemic continues and as the cost of lots of things is going up. Please help us to remember that you're in control, that this is your world, and that we can trust you. Please help those who can't afford the rising bills to get the help they need, and help us to love and care for one another. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the freedom we have to meet in church together. We want to pray for Christians in other countries where it is not easy. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for Christians in China as the government makes it more and more difficult for, for Christians to meet and share the gospel with others. Please give the church leaders wisdom to know the best way to respond to the restrictions and soften the hearts of the leaders of the country. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Luke, one of our mission partners, teaching English in Senegal. Thank you for the good team he is working with and the opportunities he has to teach in a number of different places. Please help him as he prepares to teach business English class this month and as he prepares a Bible slot, which will be talking about proverbs and parables. Please be with Luke and help him as he meets a Christian from Madagascar to study 1 Peter together. We pray both of them will grow to be more like Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can meet together today. We pray that you will be with Trevor, who is, who is preaching today, from Ephesians chapter 4. Help us to listen carefully and remember the things he says, so that we will live lives of true righteousness and holiness. Lord Jesus, lots of people around tell us that we should live for ourselves. Help us not to listen to them, but to listen to you and live a life for you instead. Amen.
the giver of life. And you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you Our reading today is taken from Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24. So, I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, and separated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learnt when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You are taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by is the seed for the age. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in the true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you're a football fan or not, but whether you love football or loathe it, I'm sure you've heard of Manchester United. They are the most successful English club ever, with 20 premiership titles to their name, and also the richest club in the world. But at the moment, let's just say things are not great this season. In fact, dismal compared to their previously very high standards. Now, one of the most successful players was a captain called Roy Keane, who is now a Sky Sports pundit. In character, he's fiery, to say the very least. Ability-wise, probably one of the greatest midfield players the Premier League has ever seen. Now, watching his reaction this season has been, to say the least, entertaining. Having watched yet another abject United performance, he is literally spitting blood. It's not the player's talent that annoys and angers him, but their lack of effort, their lack of pride in representing Manchester United. How can you stroll around, not putting effort in, when you wear a Manchester United shirt? Don't you realise who you're playing for? Don't you realise what bad is on your chest? Don't you realise that you are, your identity is, a Manchester United player? And Manchester United players don't play like that. And the same principle can be applied to your family. My name's Trevor Pierce. You're a Pierce. You don't act like that. It can be applied to your national identity. We are British. We don't act like that. Or with regard to our leaders, I wish you didn't act like that because you represent me. Now, thankfully, the Apostle Paul doesn't have the aggression and the angst that Roy Keane has. But the point these verses is making is the same. Your identity should control how you think. Your identity must control how you act. Your identity controls your lifestyle. And if it doesn't, then something is seriously wrong. But before we look at these verses, let's remind ourselves how Paul structures his letter, the book of Ephesians. And the structure is pretty easy to follow. In Ephesians 1 to 3, Paul focuses all his time on looking at just one thing, our identity. 19 verses from chapters 1 to 3 
focus on the Christian's new identity. Let me just give you a taster of some of the rich titles and privileges that are ours. Just one from each chapter. Look at chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. And what that shows us is that our identity as God's children is cemented to God's eternal choice of us. We are God's children because of God's choice. Thankfully, not because of our choice. And chapter 2 reveals that the spiritual life we have is a gift of God. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins. It is by grace you have been saved. We are, you are, one of God's eternally loved children. Therefore, chapter 3, verse 12, you can approach God with freedom and confidence. We are, you are, one of God's eternally loved children, and therefore, we're always welcomed into God's presence. Now, that's just a taster of chapters 1 to 3, all focused upon our identity. But when we get to Ephesians 4 to 6, the focus moves from identity to the lifestyle that should accompany that identity. If you are one of God's eternally loved children, then Paul is saying, this is, how you, this is how you are to live. Now, if Paul was preaching this passage today, maybe he would change our liturgy. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Maybe he'd change it to, this is who you are, so obey the word of the Lord. Now, here's our first point, our first point your old shirt. Surprisingly, Paul starts with a long, hard look at the team we used to represent, the old shirt, if you like the old shirt we used to wear. Look at verse 17. So I tell you this and insist it on in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. So what's Paul got to say about the old shirt, the old badge, the old old lifestyle? Well, the first thing is this. The old shirt equals old thinking. Paul's first major concern focuses upon our thinking. If we are to live a worthy life, chapter 4, verse 1, then we must change the way we think. Just look with me to see how Paul describes how you used to think before you became a Christian. So I tell you this and insist insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, the words and phrases Paul uses to describe how we used to think, well, they need explaining. Our thinking was futile. Our understanding was darkened. Now, just just ponder those descriptions. Before you were a Christian, that's how God viewed the way that you thought. Your thinking was futile, and your understanding was darkened. Now think for a moment of some of your family members who are not followers of Jesus, or maybe your friends or work, your your friends or your work colleagues, who still wear the old shirt you once wore. Paul says their thinking is futile and darkened. Now what does Paul mean by these by these words? At first it may feel a little extreme. Maybe Paul's being even a little rude. So what does Paul mean? Well, let me define what Paul means by a futile thinking and a darkened mind or darkened understanding. Let me define what what, what you're saying. Let me define these words and phrases. A way of thinking that leaves no place for God. A way of thinking that leaves no place for God. It's not referring to someone's intellect or natural gifts, but instead how they relate to their intellect and the gifts they have. Just think about how you used to live before you were a Christian. The moral choices you made. Did God ever get a look in? Or maybe the choices you used to make concerning how you raised your children and the values you wanted to build into their lives. Was God ever a part of that picture? Did you, ever thank, did you ever thank him or consult him? A way of thinking that leaves no place for God. Now, 
If there's no all-powerful, all-knowing creator God, then thinking that is fine. Thinking like I've just described is fine. And Paul is rude and disrespectful. But if there is an all-powerful, all-wise God who created us, then it's a pretty good description of what you once thought and how you once act, acted. You see, Paul teases out this in the next verse. Look at verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Your thinking before you were a Christian was ignorant, for it had no place for God, the all-wise creator, all-knowing God. You were separated from the life of God. And the separation was, was your choice because you had chosen to. Look at verse 18. You had hardened your heart towards God. Before you were a Christian, that was you. That was me. You see, God has put inside all of us a kind of divine satnav that reminds us that God is eternal, creator and judge. But we hate that thought. For we want to be in charge. We want to be the ones who make the rules. So we either ignore the divine satnav that tells us that God is creator, saviour and judge, or we kind of get our screwdriver out and we try and rewire it. So the satnav says what we want to say instead of what God says. That's what Paul means by ignorant and hardening of our hearts, which of course then affects and dominates your lifestyle. Look at verse 19. Having lost all sensitivity, they've, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. We used to live a greedy life, which is shorthand for we took God's gifts, we took what he gave us, but we never thanked him. Think back to the time before you were a Christian. Think of all the good, good gifts that God gave you. A loving family, an education, food, a warm house. So many material blessings. And what's the difference now, now that you're a Christian? Well now, daily, you thank God for those things. Before you just took them, never thanked. Which is what God calls greed. Now this morning, as you're listening to me, maybe there's someone who, maybe you, still think like that. Taking him from God, never thanking him. Living life, making choices, as if there is no God. If that's the case, when you repent today, today, when you come to God and ask him to forgive you for that kind of thinking, today you can become, today, an eternally loved, always welcome child of God. Please ask God today for that new life, for him to forgive you in what the Lord Jesus has done upon the cross. And I guarantee you he's promised to, and he will. If you want to become a Christian, then maybe you want to speak to someone in the church, a Christian whom you know. Or you can go on the All Souls website and you can download and find out when the next Christianity Explored is. And you can come on that online. Second major point is your new shirt, new teacher, and new subject. You see, enough thinking about the old shirt. Paul now wants to turn our attention to our new team and the new shirt we wear. Our minds have been liberated by the grace of God, so Paul expects us to de dedicate our lives to learning. Just look how that theme dominates verse, from verse 20 onwards. That, however, is not the way you learned. When you heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard of your former way of life to put off the old self. Paul is clear. Your new identity controls your lifestyle. Your old thinking and lifestyle, which Paul has described, is gone, it's finished with, it's over. Spiritually dead people might think like that, but eternally loved children who are loved by God don't. Instead, we are to remember what we heard and were taught about Christ. Now, 
What do you think Paul means by the phrase taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus? I'm pretty sure what Paul's speaking about is everything that he's spoken of in chapters 1 to 3. All that God has done in history through his son is what we should be learning about. Now, when I was at school, good learning, or what generated a desire to learn, was based on two things. The teacher and the subject. If the teacher was good, then there was every chance learning would be pleasurable. If the subject was good, then there was every chance that learning would be exciting. As a Christian, our teacher is the Holy Spirit, and the subject is the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, what better teacher? What better subject? Now, let me ask you a question. Does that excite you? Your teacher is God the Holy Spirit. And his one subject, his one passion, is to help you learn and explore the beauty and the brilliance of the Lord Jesus, God the Son. Just turn back with me to chapter 3, and you will see what I mean. Chapter 3, verse 17. Paul prays, and he prays this, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that love, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What is it that Paul is praying? He prays for us as God's people to grasp how high and wide and deep is Christ's love for us. Now, All Souls Church, I've come to realise, values education very highly. I've witnessed that in the lives of the young people here for the last 13 years. The question for each of us is do we value our new teacher, the Holy Spirit, and what he wants to educate us in? How is the Holy Spirit, through God's word, currently educating you in your thinking? Your thinking regarding how you relate to others, your family, your work colleagues, your neighbours, maybe your fellowship group. Now, if you've listened to Charlie's series in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, you have been treated to a series inspired by the the Holy Spirit, for it's been based squarely and wholly on the Holy Spirit's word, the, the word of God, the Bible. If you listen to that series, I guarantee you, the Holy Spirit will educate you on how your identity shapes your behavior. One of the most important marks that you as a Christian is that you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. And the mark that you have the Holy Spirit inside you is that you will want to learn about Jesus. If you don't want to learn about Jesus, then reading the New Testament, it was a sign that you haven't got the Spirit. If you do want to learn about Jesus, then it's a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work. You see, as the Holy Spirit shows you Jesus, his beauty and his brilliance, as he shows you Christ, your lifestyle your behaviour will change. The old thinking, the old identity, the old shirt needs to be taken off, unlearned and replaced by new thinking, for you are now part of God's new humanity. Which is the point that Paul makes in verse 22. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let me ask you another question. When was the last time the Holy Spirit excited you about Jesus? We've just thought about a preaching series. What about your personal Bible readings? At the moment, in my, in my quiet times, in my personal Bible readings, I'm reading through Matthew's Gospel. Many of you will know the story of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin and friend. And in Matthew 14, we have an account of the, his vicious murder at the hands of King Herod. And as I was reading my Bible, the Holy Spirit showed me a little bit of the beauty and the brilliance of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 12, we read, John's disciples came and took his body body and buried it. 
Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now, if you've lost someone dear to you, it's not hard to enter into the deep grief and pain the Lord Jesus must have been feeling and experiencing. In his deep anguish, he finds a solitary place to be with his own thoughts and to grieve the vicious murder of his dear friend. But then what follows? Look at chapter 14, verse 13. Hearing, that, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. The Lord Jesus wants, needs time alone. Yet when he sees the crowd, he still feels compassion for them. He still serves their needs. You are God's eternal child. And the Holy Spirit's one aim is to show you more of the brilliance and the beauty of the Lord Jesus. So that you, so that I, chapter 4, verse 24, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Are you daily learning from your teacher, the Holy Spirit? Can I finish by asking you one more question? When was the last time the Holy Spirit showed you your sin and your selfishness? The kind of things that stop you being like the Lord Jesus. Areas of your thinking and acting which are not reflecting your new identity. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Are you developing this kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit? Are you giving him time to shape your character as you daily read God's word? Verse 24, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, it's so important, so important, that we as Christians get our motivation right. Our motivation for Christian living if we're not being changed by the beauty and brilliance of the Lord Jesus, if our lifestyle does not, is not grounded and built upon our new identity in Christ, then it's probably just morality or legalism that we're living. And that sadly nearly always leads to self-righteousness. I saw this on Twitter this week, which kind of sums up what I'm trying to say. Legalism lacks the supreme sense of worship. It obeys, but it doesn't adore. A legalistic or self-righteous version of Christianity is nearly always ugly and unattractive. But if we get the order right, then we will shine like stars in a dark world. Then change will not merely be moral, but instead a response to who Christ is and what he's done. As we learn every day to come to God's word and ask the Holy Spirit, our teacher, to show us Christ, so we grow into his likeness, in true righteousness and holiness. Are you hungry to wear the shirt? Well, having heard God's word, we now come to a time of confession together. Let's take a moment now to allow God's Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin, to highlight those places where God's word has illumined our need for confession and repentance. And so we say the confession together. Father, we come in humility and thanks. We thank you for your eternal love that secures our salvation and makes us your children. We thank you too for the Holy Spirit who teaches us about the beauty and brilliance of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Forgive us when we don't listen to him and neglect reading his life-giving word. 
that makes us more like Jesus. Help us this week to enjoy learning from our teacher, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, having heard God's word and confessed our sins together, let's now sing our final song together. It's a wonderful song that calls us to go out to serve Christ. Hear the call of the kingdom. Well, we come now to the blessing and let's hear afresh the words that the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to tell the people of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.